They introduce the next lecture about her two positive early breast cancer is Dr. Christina Galvez. She is currently the head of the Committee on Research at the St. Luke's Medical Center Cancer Institute of the Bonifacio Global City in Taguig, Philippines. She has strong research experience as principal investigator and co-investigator on numerous clinical trials in lung and breast cancers. She is also a member of the Board of Examiners for the Philippine Specialty Board in Medical Oncology and a past president of the Philippine Breast Cancer Society. May we call on Dr. Christina Galvez to introduce our second lecturer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our second speaker for this Meet the Experts Session 1 on Breast Cancer is a world-renowned researcher and cancer specialist known for her impact in designing innovative clinical trials and for her patient-centered humanitarian passion, Dr. Edith A. Perez. We'll talk on residual disease after neoadjuvant treatment with a case discussion. She is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and the director of the Breast Cancer Translational Genomics Program. She is a supplemental consultant at the Division of Hematology Oncology, Department of Internal Medicine, and Department of Cancer Biology, Mayo Clinic in Florida, USA, and has held positions at various professional organizations, including American Association for Cancer Research, American Society of Clinical Oncology, and the National Cancer Institute has authored more than 700 research articles in journals, books, and abstracts, and has lectured at several national and international meetings. She serves on the editorial board of multiple academic journals. Her research interests include breast cancer, translational clinical trials, evaluation of clinical markers as predictors for breast cancer development, and for breast cancer aggressiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Edith A. Perez. Uh, hello, I'm Dr. Edith Perez, a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic and chief medical officer of Bolt Biotherapeutics. A pleasure to share some uh, fascinating data with you today. Great. Uh, the topic for today's uh, discussion will be residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy a new decision point in her to positive disease. And disclosures are listed here. Here's a brief outline of what I will cover in these next several minutes with you. First of all, share the study rationale and key efficacy as well as safety data from the Catherine study, then proceed with uh, newer reports addressing exploratory analysis of clinical interest and then we'll close the presentation with a patient case discussion applicable to the topics discussed in the presentation. First, let's go over uh, the Catherine study rationale, key efficacy and safety data in an abbreviated manner uh, as I'm going to briefly summarize information that has been available over the last year or so and then proceed with newer data. First, it's been well known in the literature that patients who achieve a pathological complete response uh, after neoadjuvant therapy for breast cancer tend to do better than those who do not achieve a pathological uh, complete response. If one uh, evaluates uh, how significant this problem is, and by problem I mean the patients who do not achieve pathological co complete response to optimized combination anti her therapy uh, with chemotherapy, we can appreciate that approximately 50% of patients uh, are in that category. In other words, they receive best therapy in the neoadjuvant setting, but they still do not achieve a pathological complete response. So evaluating strategies to best manage these patients is very important in 2020 and beyond. So here we have the schema of the Catherine study, well known to most of you, in which patients uh, received uh, neoadjuvant therapy as per investigator's discretion. Then they proceeded with surgery. If they were found to have residual invasive tumor, where the invasive tumor could be either in the breast or the lymph nodes, then they were randomized to uh, the continuation of anti her strategy with uh, trastuzumab for 14 cycles or 
trastuzumab and tansin for the same duration of therapy. Please note that radiation and endocrine therapy uh, were allowed as per institutional uh, guidelines. Here we we'll have briefly the baseline patient characteristics that were well balanced as expected in, in a large randomized tech clinical trial, such as Catherine, with approximately 21% of the patients being younger than 40 years of age, and approximately 9% of the patients uh, having an age of 65 or older. The, the study was conducted in multiple parts of the, of the world. The majority of patients received anthracycline as, as part of the neoadjuvant uh, therapy. And in terms of the anti-HER2 neoadjuvant therapy, the majority of patients were treated with chemotherapy trastuzumab, but about 20% of patients received actually dual anti-HER2 uh, blockade uh, in addition to, to chemotherapy. There were various stratification uh, factors which remain uh, very relevant today, including the clinical stage at presentation, hormone receptor status, uh, the type of neoadjuvant therapy the patients received from the HER2 standpoint, as well as the pathological nodal status uh, when it was evaluated after uh, the neoadjuvant uh, therapy. It was very interesting in this trial that the majority of patients, you know, approximately 72, 73% of the patients had um, a hormone a receptor positive uh, disease, which when uh, evaluated compared to other studies, is actually a little bit higher uh, than uh, I and would have anticipated if this had been a purely adjuvant trial. But in the post-neoadjuvant setting, this was not unexpected, as it is um, much more difficult to achieve a pathological complete response for patients whose tumors are hormone receptor positive compared to those uh, with tumors that are hormone receptor and negative. The baseline uh, disease characteristics were also well balanced uh, amongst uh, the, the two arms of, of the study. And here the data are actually quite interesting as, as there were uh, about 41% of the patients uh, in, in each one of the arms that actually had a fairly uh, small uh, res residual uh, tumor at the time of tumor initiation. Uh, or at, at the time of initiation of anti-tumor neoadjuvant therapy. But of course, these patients would have had to have positive lymph nodes for them to be enrolled in the study. At the same time, the fact that some of these patients started with a small primary tumor allows us to look at the data of this subgroup, uh, which I will share with you uh, in subsequent slides uh, today. Uh, there was also the information about residual nodal disease at the time of, of definite uh, surgery, which uh, also is, is very important. And let me just really briefly address uh, the, the primary endpoint of the Catherine study, which clearly demonstrated a very impressive improvement in invasive disease-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.50, an absolute improvement of 11.3% at the three-year uh, time point. And these uh, data were reported uh, first at the San Antonio Breast Meeting and then in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. We have here uh, the, the forest plot uh, related to demonstrating uh, the range of efficacy in terms of hazard ratio for uh, all the, the pre-identified uh, subgroups, clearly demonstrating that TDM1 fared better than trastuzumab for all of the subgroups uh, analyzed. Uh, we also know that uh, there was uh, an assessment of the first occurrence of an invasive disease free survival event. And most important to realize is that uh, most of, of, of uh, the events were actually uh, demonstrated uh, in the patients who had trastuzumab 22% compared to 12% incidence of invasive uh, disease-free events for patients uh, who received uh, TDM1 or trastuzumab and tansy. So clearly demonstrating the magnitude of the benefit by uh, the patients receiving TDM1 compared uh, to, to trastuzumab. And most of this uh, difference actually was observed right here at, at, at the, the distance recurrence uh, evaluation. And this is extremely important because distance recurrence is a type of recurrence that has the most negative impact 
uh, for our patients uh, who have a diagnosis of breast cancer. Uh, now let's look at a secondary endpoint of the Catherine trial, uh, demonstrating specifically distant recurrences uh, between the two arms. Uh, and again, there was a clear benefit for a distant recurrence uh, uh, rate, uh, particularly as, as this graph demonstrates the distance recurrence free rate. As you see the higher number here for patients who received the TDM1 compared to to trastuzumab with a hazard ratio of 0 0.60. Now let's take a quick look at uh, adverse events uh, demonstrated between the, the two arms of the study. First of all, the trastuzumab arm in terms of uh, grade three or, or higher uh, AEs, 15% uh, percent versus 26% for the patients who received TDM1. If one looks at the serious AEs, uh, the 8% versus 12.7%, essentially, uh, you know, no, no adverse events with, with fatal um, outcome. Again, very important uh, when we consider therapy for our uh, patients. In terms of discontinuation of treatment due to adverse events, they occur very, occurred very rarely in the herceptin trastuzumab arm, but they occurred with greater frequency in the TDM1 uh, arm, and we will go over the, over the reasons for discontinuation uh, next. So here we have the information related to the most common adverse events leading to discontinuation for uh, both arms of the trial. And you can see, as, as I shared previously, it was 2.1% for uh, trastuzumab, 18% for TDM1. And the main reasons included the decreased uh, the platelet count, increase of, of, uh, of, of bilirubin, uh, smiled ele elevations of, of liver enzymes. And in a few patients, the therapy was discontinued because of peripheral sensory and neuropathy. And although we're not gonna talk about this, the, the, the risk of developing neuropathy was increased if patients uh, you know, had received uh, you know, no, uh, a prior uh, taxin or platinum agents. Now let's go over the general um, uh, TDM1 uh, related AEs in, in the context of the adverse events observed with trastuzumab. And again, you know, we have here in the kind of orange uh, color, so the data for trastuzumab in kind of purplish colors, we have the data for, for TDM1. So we can appreciate that some of the main issues observed with TDM1 included some increased uh, risk of, of fatigue, certainly including some increases if in peripheral neuropathy, some uh, increases in terms of the, uh, lowering of platelet counts, it's really important, however, to know that uh, hemorrhage uh, was very infrequent, and actually the rate of hemorrhage was actually similar between the two uh, treatment groups. There was a small group of patients who actually experienced a grade three or greater uh, adverse events uh, in, in the clinical uh, study, uh, but it, it's anyhow important to note this uh, because you know we utilize these agents at, uh, on a regular basis in our, in, in our clinics. Again, the main issues are to, to pay attention to thrombocytopenia, to pay attention to, uh, to peripheral neuropathy. A very few cases here in terms of the AST increases uh, that led to the, the severity that was uh, three or greater. Most patients in this study also received um, uh, radiation uh, therapy. As you see here, uh, uh, the, the, the figures or the lines for uh, the patients on uh, on radiation uh, therapy are 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 given right here versus patients uh, who did not receive radiation therapy and really the the main uh, impact of, of this data are that there were fewer invasive disease free survival recurrences in the TDM1 TDM1 arms arm compared to trastuzumab. So uh, the radiation therapy did not impact uh, the, the differential benefit of TDM1 compared to trastuzumab in these patients who had not achieved pathological complete response after chemotherapy, as well as anti her treatment. Uh, here we have um, the information related to radiation pneumonitis, ex ex extremely uh, are rare in this particular study. Uh, but important, you know, to anyhow at least uh, share this information with you because it provides confidence related to the tolerability uh, between TDM1 and, and radiation therapy uh, for the breast cancer. 
In terms of overall results, the overall results data uh, have not been updated since uh, 2019, since last year. So we're awaiting further follow-up uh, because the number of events, it's still uh, too early to draw statistical conclusions related to survival differences between the two arms of the trial. In summary, uh, the patients uh, with residual invasive disease following neoadjuvant therapy have been known to have an increased risk of recurrence and death. With the results of the Catherine study, it was clearly demonstrated that TDM1 was a better approach compared to, to trastuzumab as post-neoadjuvant therapy. The side effect profiles of, of both strategies were consistent with previously uh, known data. And the benefit of TDM1 was consistent regardless of uh, re radiation therapy. Well, now let me move to some exploratory analysis of clinical interest. And we'll be quite brief on this. However, uh, I want to address them for everyone's benefit as these are situations that we encounter in the clinic on a regular basis. Number one, small tumors are diagnosis, small amounts of residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy, whether there was an impact if there was a HER2 status change between uh, the initiation of neoadjuvant therapy or at the time of definite surgery. What happened with the patients who developed CNS metastasis at first site of recurrence? Uh, as well, let's take a look at the concomitant hormonal therapy in the context of the comparator arms in the Catherine study. First, small tumors are diagnosis, so uh, uh, T1C tumors are no negative. Again, this is a diagnosis. Well, patients with, uh, with small tumors are diagnosis. Clearly, uh, they derive numerical benefit from uh, being randomized to the TDM1 compared to trastuzumab. Please know that there were only six invasive disease-free events in the trastuzumab arm and none in the TDM1 group. The, the numbers of patients you know, were rather small, so we want to be certainly careful about grandiose st uh, you know, statistical comments. However, it is it's clear that the data suggests that patients with small tumors, so just T1C tumors, can have residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy and that those patients appear to benefit from TDM1 treatment compared to being managed uh, with uh, trastuzumab. Now let me go uh, to the patient population who had small amounts of residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy. So here is uh, some of uh, these uh, data. Uh, first of all, here we have uh, the clinical uh, uh, measurements from the pathological evaluation T0, T1A, T1B, T1 uh, with uh, microinvasion or T1AS. And as you can see here, that we have the data related to the forest plot demonstrated that TDM1 was better than trastuzumab. So uh, again, an important factor because some may think, well, if a patient has just a little bit of tumor left, perhaps uh, you know, we don't need to use you know, maxim maximization of anti-HER2 therapy. And again, the Catherine trial demonstrated that even for patients who have small primary tumors after neoadjuvant therapy, there, were, there was still you know, a benefit to TDM1 compared to, to trastuzumab. Um, the data were also looked at in terms of the regional lymph node involvement at definite surgery. And as you can see, uh, as you can see here, there was consistent uh, benefit to TDM1 compared to trastuzumab independent of uh, the type of nodal um, uh, pathological findings that were identified uh, after neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, there, there are, as you know, several ways to evaluate a residual uh, tumor after neoadjuvant therapy, and one of those is called the residual cancer burden. So the data from uh, the, the Catherine trial were evaluated uh, using this other system in addition to looking at quote unquote just uh, the primary tumor uh, or looking uh, you know, independently at the leaf nodes. And again, the data were uh, uh, consistent with what we've known uh, for a while, which means that the uh, residual cancer burden uh, uh, system has prognostic uh, of value. So the patients with a higher uh, uh, RCV uh, demonstrated a worse uh, outcome again, uh, consistent with data that have been identified in other studies. So let's look at a, at a third situation, uh, which, uh, you know, has gathered a lot of interest. You know, what happens if when you do neoadjuvant uh, therapy and then the patients have surgery and you retest the tumor, it is found that the tumor uh, reportedly is no longer HER2 positive. 
So uh, let's look at the data from Catherine. Uh, you know, the study originally had about 1,500 patients with her positive disease. Then uh, we, the, there were patients who uh, had, you know, the pre-neoadjuvant uh, samples uh, used for eligibility. And then uh, the, there were 845 patients who had uh, uh, HER2 positivity uh, with paired uh, surgical samples. As you can see here, uh, then uh, we had also in the, in the particular study, 289 uh, cases or about 20% of the cases that had surgical samples for, uh, for eligibility. So when there was this exploratory analysis of changes of HER2 status, um, if the, in the surgical samples, 92% of the patients were HER2 positive, uh, but approximately 70 patients uh, or 8.3% of the patients when they had the, the post-neoadjuvant surgery were identified as having uh, negative HER2 uh, results. Certainly the reasons for these are complicated, uh, but you know, based on the data that you will see next, as well as other studies, it may be a, an issue of uh, tumor heterogeneity, uh, because I mean, look at what happened. In the 70 patients with HER2 negative disease after retesting of surgical samples, there were no invasive disease for survival events in patients who were randomized to TDM1. There were 11 uh, invasive disease-free uh, events in patients who were randomized to the trastuzumab arm, uh, showing a numerical benefit for using TDM1 compared to trastuzumab. Of course, the data need to be, be interpreted with caution due to the small uh, sample size. Then the fourth situation was CNS metastasis at first sight or recurrence. So let's look at this in a stepwise fashion. I had I, I shown you previously the first sight of uh, a tumor uh, a recurrence in the context of the Catherine trial. And we can look certainly at the cases of distal recurrence. And I alluded to that the cases of distant recurrence were lower in the TDM1 arm compared to the trastuzumab arm. But then one can look at the cases of CNS recurrence as first event. It was 5.9% versus 4.3% for trastuzumab. So many uh, uh, people uh, st started to say, well, what is really happening with this? Um, is it that, that something um, is to be concerned about related to, to TDM1 in the context of, of the overall likelihood that the patients will develop CNS recurrence? So it was really good that there was a, a follow-up uh, analysis of the total number of patients with CNS recurrence in the trastuzumab arm versus the TDM1 arm. And as you see, the numbers are 5.4% versus 6.1%. So although there was a numerical higher incidence of CNS recurrences as first invasive disease-free survival events in TDM1 versus trastuzumab, it is likely really due to competing risk, risk as was observed in, some, in the adjuvant trials that have been performed. And essentially, um, the, the overall risk of developing CNS metastasis is really not that different uh, between the two arms of the study. So I don't think this is an issue that should be of particularly serious concern uh, for us in the clinic. Except I must say that uh, uh, we're looking for agents to decrease the ultimate rate of CNS metastasis. So I need to be balanced on my discussion of, of this issue for all, for all of us. However, a very important aspect uh, is being addressed on this slide, and it is what happens to the overall survival if patients developed or did not develop CNS metastasis. And, and here we have uh, the data from this study in the uh, trastuzumab uh, emtansin or TDM1 arm in uh, purple here versus trastuzumab, as you see. If the patients develop CNS metastasis, there was no increased risk of, of death. Um, uh, if the patients had received a TDM1 or be, patients received uh, trastuzumab. So uh, no evidence that the numerically higher rate of CNS recurrence as the first event in the TDM1 had a detrimental impact on overall survival. Now let me look, uh, look, uh, look at the, the last um, subgroup uh, or extra analysis to share with you today. Yeah, and it is uh, the issue of concomitant hormonal therapy, because you remember a, a large number of patients in, in, in the Catherine study, 72% uh, of, of patients had hormone receptor positive disease. Of notice that almost all of those patients, 98%, 
I received a hormonal therapy in both treatment arms of the study. And again, it's, uh, you know, the, this actually did not have a, an effect related to the benefit of TDM1 compared to uh, trastuzumab. So uh, there were still, you know, fewer invasive free survival uh, disease recurrences in the TDM1 arm, TDM1 arm, irrespective of hormone receptor status. There were no safety signals observed, and that, that occurred irrespective of whether the patients received hormonal therapy or not. So as a summary of uh, this uh, newer kind of subgroup analysis I've shared with you, we can say, number one, the uh, invasive disease-free survival benefit of TDM1 was consistent among uh, all uh, exploratory subgroups analyzed, including patients with small amounts of residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy. Again, very important for practice. Number two, TDM1 should not be withheld in patients with her to negative residual disease at surgery. Uh, you know, based on the biology of this disease, I really think that her to negative residual disease it um, you know, may be an, an artifact of a tumor heterogeneity. Number three, uh, the numerically higher incidence of CNS recurrence as the first uh, IDFS event in the TDM1 arm versus trastuzumab is likely due to competing risk and uh, there was not a detrimental uh, impact on overall survival if the patients developed uh, CNS metastasis in the TDM1 arm versus trastuzumab arm. And you know, in essence, you know, the totality of this data justify the summary statement that the data from Catherine have introduced a new decision point in the management of patients with HER2 positive early stage breast cancer, where the adjuvant treatment you know, can and should be optimized based on response to neoadjuvant therapy. Certainly, uh, you know, based on this uh, strong data. Uh, the fact is uh, that TDM1 is not recommended for patients with residual invasive disease after neoadjuvant therapy by multiple societies, you know, NCCN, the ESMO guidelines, the AGO guidelines, the, the St. Gallen uh, guidelines. So if, if I want to put this in the context of our day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, clinical practice, uh, the, 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 the strong point is that we now have the ability to tailor adjuvant therapy based on response to neoadjuvant therapy. And we can utilize the data from the Catherine study to, to make appropriate decisions for patients. So if a patient has uh, appropriately uh, uh, outlined neoadjuvant therapy, you know, in these days, of course, the things have evolved compared to neoadjuvant therapy when the Catherine study was initiated because now, the majority of patients receive combination chemotherapy plus pertuzumab plus trastuzumab if they're deemed to be candidates for a neoadjuvant therapy. But if at the time of surgery, uh, the patient is found to have residual invasive disease, that's where we have an opportunity to tailor treatment to TDM1 in the adjuvant setting. If patient achieves a complete response, the standard of care remains continuation of pertuzumab, uh, trastuzumab, because again, remember, these patients were deemed to be high risk of disease based on the fact that physicians elected to use a neoadjuvant therapy. So in that setting, the combination of pertuzumab, trastuzumab is standard of care. Uh, many people ask, uh, Edith, but how about um, administering uh, uh, pertuzumab, trastuzumab right here if the patients have residual disease, well, even though it may be appealing, uh, the, the issue is that we just don't have a comparative trial as Catherine uh, only compared trastuzumab versus TDM1. Uh, so although um, PH or pertuzumab, trastuzumab could be an option, we prefer to manage patients based on the data that have been collected in well-conducted clinical trials. And that's why, why TDM1 has become uh, the, the recommended strategy by societies and uh, essentially the majority of physicians in, in clinical practice. So, um, you know, the, the treatment guidelines really address uh, the, the point that I just made in, in a kind of more simplified slide, which is, you know, if a patient uh, have a diagnosis of early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, they, but they have a tumor that is small, uh, we would then proceed with surgery. If uh, the surgery demonstrates that the primary tumor was small and pathological, there was no evidence of lymph node involvement, then an appropriate therapy for these patients will be paclitaxel with trastuzumab. However, if the patient started with a small tumor, but at the time of surgery, it was found that the patient had no positive disease, then we would recommend pertuzumab, trastuzumab. 
But today we're really focusing more and more on this uh, situation where the patients are deemed to be at higher risk of recurrence when they are diagnosed with breast cancer. So these are the patients you would consider for pertuzumab, trastuzumab based chemotherapy regimen, four to six cycles, patients that undergo surgery. If the patients have residual disease, TDM1 as per the Catherine study, again, if the patients achieve a PCR, the standard would be to complete uh, pertuzumab, trastuzumab. So I've, I've shared with you a lot of information. Uh, first, a refresher of the uh, top line data from Catherine, a lot of subset studies that help us really put the data into perspective. I've shared with you guidelines from societies. So I thought I would close uh, just for a few minutes to, uh, uh, to be able to put this in perspective of a patient situation. So here we have uh, the, the, the schematic of, 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 a, of, a, of a patient uh, history. A patient 45 years uh, of age, a GRAVA3, PARA3, the patient uh, found a right-sided breast mass. A patient had been in, in good health prior to this, um, but uh, the, you know, the, the, this finding of a, of a hard, movable, uh, non-tender uh, breast mass uh, led um, uh, to uh, ultimate you know, evaluation by, uh, by the medical team. Uh, noting though the patient had, had a history, a family history of, of, of breast cancer. And on physical examination, there was uh, the demonstration not only that the patient had a three by two and a half centimeter uh, tumor uh, with her erythema, but there was a palpable 1.8 uh, centimeter axillary nib node. So uh, this patient's clinical uh, staging is consistent with high risk early stage uh, uh, breast cancer. The ultrasound was performed as well as mammogram. The patient had an, a, a, an excellent uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. The patient had an evaluation for potentially metastatic sites as it is appropriate to uh, conduct in the setting of high risk uh, clinical uh, uh, breast cancer. The, um, uh, the, the, the biopsy performed that demonstrated that the tumor was estrogen receptor positive, PR negative, but HER2 positive by immunohistochemistry with a plus uh, three or a three plus scoring. So the, the clinical stage uh, was stage 2B, ER positive, PR negative, HER2 positive disease. Uh, based on uh, this uh, finding, it was uh, felt to be appropriate that the patient received neoadjuvant therapy, which was administered with combination of dual anti HER2 blockade uh, with osetaxel after which the patient underwent a modified radical mastectomy. Unfortunately, the patient was found to have a residual tumor after neoadjuvant therapy, but on the other hand, there was no evidence of lymphovascular invasion. Uh, at the same time, there was one positive uh, residual uh, lymph node. So uh, the invasive residual disease following neoadjuvant therapy uh, was a pathological uh, you know, T1 tumor, a pathological N1 uh, tumor. So consistent with a patient that would have been eligible to be randomized to the uh, T uh, Catherine trial. So the, the discussion for all of us, all of you, is what course of adjuvant therapy would you recommend in, in addition to any radiation therapy? So the options are really to proceed with the continuation of a pertuzumab, trastuzumab uh, uh, for the rest of the year. And you know, we had a chance of discussing this option um, uh, to continue you know, trastuzumab alone uh, or to uh, change the therapy to, to, to DM1. So it's important for all of us to think of you know, what we would recommend in such a situation, as well as the factors that informed uh, the uh, decision. So certainly in my particular uh, consideration, really the data are strongest uh, for a TDM1. Um, you know, uh, obviously pertuzumab plus astrastuzumab is something that would need to be investigated as part of clinical trials. So there's a, a lot of, of reference information um, that you could use uh, to uh, dig in into some of this data. Uh, you know, and there's some information certainly related to these agents. But I think this is a great slide to, to, to conclude uh, my discussion uh, with you today. Let's do now what patients need next. And that, that really to me includes taking the science into clinical trials and then adopting the results of clinical trials that are most appropriate for the patient uh, who seeks our attention. Thank you very much.
Good evening, Professor Perez. Thanks again for sharing important updates on the Catherine trial, particularly on the subgroup exploratory analysis. I have a few questions regarding some of the subgroups and your own clinical experience. First off, what is your favorite new adjuvant protocol? And do you still use anthracyclines for eligible patients? Yes, we still do for the majority of patients. Uh, certainly alternatives have been looked at, um, but based on, even on the newer uh, you know, neoadjuvant therapies, even in triple negative breast cancer, mm -hmm. I think uh, we see that there could be an advantage to the use of anthracyclines. But of course, we take into consideration the patient's overall condition and the differential safety considerations you know, for anthracycline versus the tax same platinum regimen, because they can be, of course, very different from each other. But for patients at very high risk of recurrence based on large tumors or large numbers of involved axillary lymph nodes, we're trying to maximize the chemotherapy. Thank you. And you mentioned that the most common cause of discontinuation in patients randomized to TDM1 in the uh, Catherine trial are neuropathy and transaminitis. Do we have information on when the patients opted to discontinue TDM1 due to peripheral neuropathy how, after how many cycles? And how about for those due to transaminitis? Yeah, the, the, first of all, one of the issues particularly related to neuropathy, is that the prior use of platinum uh, therapies mm -hmm. was associated uh, you know, with a potential risk of toxicity later on. So that's something to discuss with patients ahead of time. And this is actually a, a, a continuum in terms of the number of months that the patients you know, can tolerate. But the, for the first few doses, the patients tend to do pretty well. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, this can be exacerbated uh, by, by prior therapies. Right, but you think this is towards the end of uh, those uh, additional 14 cycles. Exactly, exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Not, not typically at the very beginning because the patients yes. were properly screened mm -hmm. before they were enrolled in, into the trial. And is it the same for transaminitis? You know, that can occur a little bit earlier in, in some mm -hmm. patients. So it's really very important that, that we follow the patients, that we monitor the patients. Uh, so to prevent any significant uh, issues with liver toxicity. All right. And uh, for the other subgroup of uh, hormone receptor positive disease, which according to your report, it ac accounts for about 72% of patients. Uh, in the subset of premenopausal hormone receptor positive patients who regain ovarian function, do you offer ovarian ablation on top of tamoxifen during or after TDM1? Well, you're asking me a really, really challenging but very important question because, you know, this certainly was looked at particularly in the context of, of the soft trial, you know, and that was certainly the majority of patients did not have her positive disease. Mm -hmm. And the conclusion from the soft trial was that patients who were felt to be at the highest risk of recurrence were those in which we would offer, you know, a discussion about ovarian function suppression. However, it's really important to also consider the side effects of uh, premature menopause on patients. And for some patients, this can be really, really tough. Mm -hmm. So this is a discussion truly individualized, a mm -hmm. consideration for some patients, but it's really important that we spend the time discussing the toxicities for those patients. Mm -hmm. So it's a yes and a no, depending mm -hmm. on, the, on the risk, as well as the risk of disease recurrence and the risk of tolerance to the side effects. All right. And you also discussed the impact of residual car cancer burden or RCB on prognosis. How did you measure residual car cancer burden? And should this influence our choice of adjuvant treatment? Well, you know, there are various ways in which pathologists have uh, taught us how to evaluate whether there's re residual malignancy in the tumor. Number one, is there invasive disease in the area of the tumor? Number two, is there non-invasive disease in the tumor area? Uh, no, number three, is there disease in the lymph nodes? So by, by looking at the residual cancer burden, you know, this was a, an algorithm that was developed uh, by investigators at MD Anderson, and they're actually using a, compos a composite of, mm -hmm. number one, what's in the residual tumor bed 
also what's in the lymph node. So it has the two components looking at whether there's invasive disease, the size of the invasive component, the percentage of uh, involvement of tumor in the context of the, the, the tissue that has been excised. Um, and number three, is there invasive or non-invasive component? And then when they look at uh, lymph nodes, they look in uh, not, not only the number of lymph nodes that are positive, but the maximum dimension of involvement within the lymph nodes. So a little, it's a little bit more complicated than just mm. looking under the H&E um, uh, stain under the microscope to see whether there's tumor. So it's taking the virus components, which I think are relevant. It takes more time from the yes. pathologies, but it's really a way to be consistent from institution to institution. And luckily, you know, for pathologies around the world, they're so experienced and the details of how to calculate RCB are really widely available in the internet. All right. Uh, and finally, to address the issue that was not answered by Catherine, will there be a trial to answer the question on whether pertuzumab herceptin is equivalent to TDM1 as an adjuvant treatment in patients with residual disease, or whether we should be adding pertuzumab to TDM1, particularly for those with node positive disease? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're asking me some uh, really outstanding questions relevant from the science standpoint, but also mm -hmm. tremendous relevance for patients. You know, ideally, we can think it would, be, would have been great if Catherine or also had an arm of trastuzumab yeah. versus TDM1 versus, uh, the, you know, the combination particularly of TCHP, uh, uh, you know, more mm -hmm. regimens, or even uh, the combination of TDM1 with pertuzumab. You know, we've looked at the combination of TDM1 and pertuzumab, certainly in the new adjuvant setting. We've looked at that combination in the setting of the Marianne trial in the first line yeah. setting. Mm -hmm. but it's not a combination that we use routinely or a combination that has been approved by regulatory agencies. So, so I would not uh, offer a blank recommendation of combining TDM1 with pertuzumab in this setting. The, the question though remains whether the combination of chemotherapy HP would be similar mm -hmm. to TDM1 in the post-neoadjuvant setting, you know, if there is no pathological complete response, which is your main question. And I don't think a trial is going to be developed to answer this critical question, because what's happening in the field is that people are actually co continuing to move beyond, beyond TDM1 alone. TDM1, you know, was such a major uh, improvement the, the, the THP regimen, another major improvement. So people are thinking, can we add something to one of these agents, such as an, mm -hmm. another novel agent, such as a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor mm -hmm. uh, uh, added to potentially TDM1. So we want to build from that. So mm -hmm. I think for clinicians, it's, it's really a big issue because I think based on the data that we have available, either choice could be appropriate to use right. um, you know, the THP regimen. But again, what we have now, we only have the, the prospective data from Catherine. So that's what we mm -hmm. would favor the use. If a patient does not develop pathological complete response, we will go to TDM1. If a patient develops a pathological complete response, then the appropriate recommendation will go to, be to, to uh, chemotherapy with mm -hmm. HP. So that's the way we're using. Uh, the, the, the data from the different studies to make decisions in the clinic. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paris. It has been a pleasure learning from you again. Good night. Um, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to this uh, session's Q&A portion. Um, joining us tonight are Drs. Tom Chen and Dr. Paul Corns. Hello there. Nice to be Good with evening, you. Good evening, doctors. Good evening. First of all, yeah, I'd like to congratulate our esteemed speakers for a very comprehensive and excellent lecture. Actually, our Q&A just began a while ago with a pre-recorded session with Dr. Perez, but now we're going live. So um, you are all welcome to type in your questions in the chat box. But let me start with a few that have now been, that have come in. Okay, first for Dr. Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen, what are the significant advantages of giving liposomal doxorubicin instead of conventional doxorubicin in advanced breast cancer? Yeah, so uh, thank you, to Dr. TFM, uh, for this question. I think this, uh, we did mention a lot about the 
the cumulative cardiac toxicity differences between the liposomal doxorubicin and the conventional doxorubicin. However, there are also other side effects which are quite different uh, between liposomal dox uh, and the conventional dox. So like for instance, the, uh, the nausea vomiting, uh, which the liposomal doxorubicin doesn't have very little, uh, have very little of the nausea vomiting where the conventional doxorubicin it's something that we really have to help our patient to cope with. Uh, also, um, for uh, liposomal doxorubicin, there may be some more um, of the myxitis that we have to be, be aware of. Uh, in terms of the bone marrow toxicities, um, conventional doxorubicin are more likely uh, to have the bone marrow toxicities as compared okay. with uh, liposomal doxorubicin. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the drug hypersensitivities, I think uh, we do have to be aware of uh, they may have, um, some patients are more likely to have uh, hypersensitivity to uh, liposome doxorubicin. So I always would give pre-medications to uh, prevent uh, the possible of hypersensitivity, uh, but sometimes that could be uh, adjusted with a more prolonged infusion time for liposome doxorubicin to handle the hypersensitivities. At the, I think overall, clinically, uh, my personal experience is that liposomal doxorubicin side effects are quite well handled. And without the long-term uh, cardiac toxicities, uh, it's uh, quite uh, easy to use uh, it as a long-term treatment for our breast cancer patients. Thank you, Dr. Chen. And if our patients who are on uh, conventional doxorubicin and they have metastatic <laughs> breast cancer and are fairly well controlled with it, um, as you know, there is a uh, limit to how much we can give, uh, how much conventional doxorubicin we can give. Can we actually shift to liposomal doxorubicin? How do we convert <laughs> this? Yeah, so uh, I think there's currently no like clinical trial prospectly. Um, discussing or investigating this kind of sequence, starting with conventional mm -hmm. doxorubicin followed by liposomal doxorubicin. But I think uh, as uh, alluded by uh, Dr. Liu and myself, I think these two drugs I, uh, are very similar in the drugs they have. So I think this is sometimes I would do for the practice if the patient is was started on the conventional uh, doxorubicin and you do have a stable disease and or responsive uh, from the patient. And now we know from some evidence suggesting that the longer chemotherapy we use, uh, the more likely the patient will have a longer PFS uh, in the metastatic breast and curve setting. And because we are concerned about the cardiac toxicities, so I think changing to liposome doxorubicin is uh, one of my options that I would think of to treat our patient. However, I think uh, in terms of uh, deciding whether to continue or uh, continue with anthracyclines, I think there's also in a broader sense that we need to think of when we're treating metastatic breast cancer patient after the conventional doxorubicin or, uh, or even starting with liposomal doxorubicin uh, probably after six or mostly uh, for conventional doxorubicin eight cycles, what is the tumor burden of this patient? Even we think it's as a st stable disease, uh, there are data suggesting that sometimes even switching another maintenance therapy could also be considered as uh, an option if it's just received a stable disease. If mm -hmm. by conventional doxorubicin the tumor has kind of shrunk dramatically and you have yeah. a very good response and, uh, and, and after six or eight cycles, but you can see probably a one centimeter or, or two centimeter kind of uh, moderate to low tumor burden and I think definitely continue with the treatment is uh, with uh, liposome toxin is a very good option. Okay, but how do we know if our patient already has received about 450 milligram per meter square of doxorubicin? How much more liposomal doxorubicin can we give this patient? Yeah, that's a very good question. But I think uh, from one of my slides, which uh, is a review of how many liposomal doxin they have received, uh, I think because the cumulative toxicity of anthracyclines are, um, no matter you receive at the adjuvant setting or a metastatic setting, uh, I think it doesn't really matter as long uh, 
how much of accumulative dose that you have uh, for the uh, anthracyclines. So uh, as you can see, even patients having received anthracycline in the adjuvant setting, or I think in the metastatic setting, uh, I'm not too concerned about uh, that. Just shifting mm -hmm. to liposomal dog servicing would increase the risk of cardiac toxicities. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Now, moving on to Dr. Corns. Dr. Paul, many generics are claiming that they are biosimilars uh, to the innovator drug. How do we effectively evaluate generic drugs to be biosimilars? Okay, so you've hit on a big problem that we identified with the WHO in Asia. I ran the track on affordable cancer medicines for the UICC World Cancer Congress, which was last held in Kuala Lumpur. And what we discovered was that there was widespread mistrust of generic drugs through Asia. And that was for a good reason. 20 or 30 years ago, regulators hadn't understood the importance of bioequivalence in generic medicines. Yeah. And medicines were launched that probably weren't bioequivalent. And I think if you talk to any senior doctor, people with gray hair like me, they'll tell you a story of, of drug quality that wasn't good. And what is difficult is that the WHO has thought that the same problem is being created with biosimilars. There's a world standard that was set originally by the UK MHRA, Europe's regulators, uh, EMA. It's been adopted in America, Japan, Australia, Malaysia, many countries, but there's a lower standard. And those drugs tend to be given a widespread of names like biocopies, biogenerics, uh, biomimics, uh, and we put them in a basket and call them intended copy biologics because the maker intends to copy them but doesn't meet the regulatory standards for a biosimilar. And that can be a real challenge. And it's no fault of Asia. It's usually a sign of a country where um, regulatory uh, staff and resources are low. So if you look at uh, Europe and America, it takes a year to assess a biosimilar, about 60 to 100 tests of comparability. And that takes enormous resource. So the crucial thing is to decide, are you seeing a drug that's regulated as a biosimilar or one that's regulated as an intended copy drug, but marketed as a biosimilar? So for an oncologist, it's crucial that we work very closely together with our expert hospital pharmacy colleagues. Remember, not all biosimilars are biosimilars. It's been used as a marketing term. And yet at the WHO level, it's a very strict regulatory term. And if you get a drug to that standard, we know how it'll perform. We've had uh, more than 70 approved in Europe, more than 2 billion patient days, 178 clinical trials of switching. If you use one that's regulated as a biosimilar, it will behave in such a similar way to the original that you can use them in a way interchangeably. So there's the challenge. We have to raise regulatory standards across Asia uh, in an area which is important because it's now looking after more than half the world's cancer patients. Right, I agree. Um, now we have a lot of biosimilars available in the market. How do you choose the right biosimilar brand for a particular so the, drug? Yeah. So we use what's called multi-criteria decision analysis. Mm. Price is important, but it's not everything. So I've said the first step is to look at the drugs on offer and to decide which of the three classes of drugs they are. Are they original reference drugs? Are they biosimilars regulated to a WHO biosimilar standard? Or are they intended copy biologics regulated to a lower standard? So that's the quality issue. Then you're going to look at price. And then we also look at other very important issues, security of supply. Um, having a drug that runs out partway through treatment is no help to anyone. So that's important. We know patient uh, knowledge is crucial. So having patient uh, information sheets written in languages, local languages your patients understand, is crucial. So when I switch to think as a Malaysian several times a year, we're looking to see package inserts in Barsa Malay and Cantonese, uh, as well as English, for the mixed Malay population to understand. So uh, then you'll talk to the chief nurse and she'll say, how about injection devices and uh, patient support programs? So it's a list of things and people tend to focus on price. Mm -hmm. And I'll admit that's important, but it's not everything. Yeah. 
That's true. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul and Dr. Chen, for answering those important questions regarding your lectures. Um, if there are other questions that you might want to ask our ex esteemed speakers, particularly those who are not currently here in the uh, live session, you may just type them in and we will email our speakers and we will uh, revert back to you if you uh, provide your email addresses as well. So I think it's time to close this session. Again, I'd like to congratulate our speakers and the organizers of this year's AOS. Good evening, everyone. Thank you Good all name. very much.